that it's not what you do, it's what you give permission to. And you might say, well, hang on, isn't what I do, doesn't that matter? Well, of course it does. And there are some things you do that are not right before the Lord. And you might say, but isn't that the point? But I, I would suggest to your church that it is not so much what you do, it's what you gave permission to in the first place that led you to the position of doing that at all. You're concerned about things, about what happens in your home, a besetting sin perhaps, that thing you just don't want to tell me about or anybody else about, the worries that consume your mind, your body, the, your spiritual life, where your soul is disturbed. I want to begin by telling you very, very clearly, friends, you cannot beat sin. If you ever think you can beat sin, you've lost before you started. For if it weren't for Jesus we would be lost in sin. No grit and determination, and I'll tell you something about me. I'm one of the most determined men you'll ever meet. When I make up my mind, that's the end of the story. But I know that even that determination would not conquer sin. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is not just not only, I should say, lying or stealing or coveting, those things that we first consider. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is whatever draws you away from God. If God is speaking and you've got the television up too loud, then you're missing the mark. If you're off serving God, so much that you forgot your relationship with God, then you miss the mark. And it's not what you do, it's what you give permission to. In James, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. How about you stop saying, God, would you stop doing this to me? That, that is silly. God, God is not about hurting you. God is not about tempting you. But each one is tempted. Have a, have a look at this. I, I, I could summarize this by saying, each one is tempted when he gives permission to those things that they ought not to have given permission to in their own life because you can't manage everything. And so one of the greatest wake-up calls of my life uh, is I was raised to be a man. I, I think what is lost today and quickly getting lost worldwide is masculinity, is manhood. You've got a lot of males, but less men. Men are very confused today. I wasn't, I wasn't raised that way. I, <laughs> those on the recording in other countries will think, really? And that is, here in Australia, we used to say, eat your crust, it'll put hairs on your chest. Be a man. And when I, um, if I'd cry about something, oh, when a little fella, people let you get away with it, but you get to eight, nine, ten, cry about something, the other men around would say, oh, knock it off, be a man, this sort of thing. And so it was drummed into me to be a man. And yet, nothing, not even that, not even the strongest man, not even Samson himself could conquer or battle or deal with the power of sin. It'll take you away, it'll destroy you. The Bible says here, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires 
and enticed. Thus, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. You see, you thought you could manage it. You thought you could control it. You thought you could handle it. You thought you could handle that family that said, we just want to stay for a week and they're there for six months in your home. You thought you could manage it and then you woke up one day and realized your marriage was falling apart because you gave permission for something you ought not to have given permission to. Your kids came to you and they said, could you go guarantor on a loan for a car for us? And you didn't think about it, did you? You love them and so you said yes. And then one day when they default on the loan, you gave permission for something that you are now responsible for. And now you have an issue with your children. I didn't say go not to go guarantor for a loan. I mean, don't come later to me later and say, hey, that's what I did and I believe I did the right thing. That's fine, it's up to you. But I think we need to use a bit of wisdom, don't you, about what could potentially happen later on. Are you with this church? You there? It's a good message, I want you to receive it. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away. So you want to impress those people? So you want to get a credit card and buy that thing because you just want it? Okay, well, and one of the greatest deceptions in this world is that makeup ad that says, what does it say? You're worth it, isn't it? You're worth it or something like that. Only God makes me worthy because before he came into my life, I was a sinner and God loved me enough to make me worthy. Makeup ain't going to do it, girls. Going and getting a brand new car to impress the, impress the other guys ain't going to do it either, fellas. You, if you can afford a brand new car comfortably, good. Go ahead. But if that's going to position you for a problem later on, then friend, you have given permission to something and then you'll come to me and you'll say, oh, I can't afford things. He's Jehovah Jireh, my provider, isn't he? And I think God's going to say to you, why did you give permission for that in the first place? But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And it all started because you gave permission to it in the first place. Take ownership of that before sin takes ownership of you. Can you receive that? Take ownership of the things you do ahead of time. You see, when each one is tempted, that's not sin. Oh, no. Uh, enticed, that's not sin. Thinking about your options, that's not sin. Giving permission to it, when it enters your life, now you are capable and culpable of falling into a trap where you thought you could manage it, but now it's managing you. And now you've got no control at all. And you think you can win, you will lose. But you gave permission to it. And if it weren't by the grace of God, it would continue on. How many times has God had to rescue us, huh? How many times has he had to look at us as a father would look at a child, a son or a daughter, and say, again? Really? Can we not keep doing this? In this year of truth, we've called it Truth 2023, we have to begin even more so to understand the concept of boundaries. Boundaries are good for you. Boundaries are good for me. I had a family member ring me up at 11 o'clock the other night. Now they're family, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with it is I was asleep. 
and it was just to say hi. Family member or not, I'm not giving permission to that. But isn't that insulting and you should accommodate all things with family? No. No. And I, 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 I made it crystal clear. Common courtesy is to ring before 8 o'clock. Other than that, if it's an urgent matter, I don't call. I don't care if you call me 24 hours a day. But if you call me at 11 o'clock just to say hi, <laughs> this is the response you're going to get. Is that bad? I don't think that's bad. I think because if I give permission to it, I'm now, I, I, I'm not allowing for boundaries. I'm not placing boundaries. Can you get that? I, I think we, we fall into more problems than we ought to fall into because we let people step into areas of our life they were never meant to be in the first place because we gave permission to them. Do I value my peace? I want you to ask yourself these questions. Do I value my peace? You're praying about it, are you? Oh, dear God, if I could just have some peace. Well, hang on. What are you giving permission to? That's taking, stealing from your peace. The devil's laughing at you. You're praying to God on one hand and the devil's mocking you on the other because you're giving permission to friends or family or people in your life to steal from you or you can't enter your house without uh, the, the TV being at a decibel rate that nobody can have a conversation. Or you're eating so much fast food that you're just feeling unwell all the time, says he. Who now, isn't it amazing when people get onto a health kick, they preach it to everyone else? I was never in a position to do that before, but now I am. <laughs> Do I value my finances? Do I value my family? Do I value my family? If Adam had valued his family, he would have protected his wife. But he didn't. The message of Adam and Eve in the garden is first that Adam failed to protect his wife. He was standing there with her when the serpent was talking to her. What sort of a gutless man lets a snake talk to his wife about disobeying God? So the first man wasn't a man's bootlace because he let his wife down. <laughs> Men, guard the women. And listen to the women, because the women have a lot more wisdom than us. In fact, I was just saying yesterday, if it wasn't for women, there'd be no church most of the time. But man, thank God for the women. Do I value my family? Protect them. Guard them. Speak into their lives. Sometimes you have to say, no. Teach them. You teach people how to treat you. They will learn from that, and then that they will teach others. You are praying to God. The devil's laughing at your whole, God, why is my family falling apart? Well, stop giving permission for it too. We learn so many things. Don't expose your mind and your heart to danger. Don't expose it unless God calls you to it. Don't expose yourself to danger. What sort of a young woman would walk down the street at 11 p.m. at night anymore? There was a day you could do that, girls, but you can't anymore. You can't do that. Don't think you're good enough and strong enough or able enough or can scream loud enough or your mace is always going to work. Don't do things like that. Men, don't travel in a car alone with a woman if you're a married man. Don't do things like that. You've forgotten boundaries. Do you understand? Say amen. Yeah, amen. Yeah, somebody over that side. This side's still trying to work it out. Sinners over here saved. No, I'm kidding. All right, come on. Come on. I, you see, 
You don't want to give permission to something and don't say to me, oh, look, she's fine, I'm fine, it's perfectly safe. Don't give permission to it in the first place. Draw the line early. Draw it early and you'll be good to go. And then the enemy has no place or room in your life. Right? Then the devil's got to move on to the next person because he's got no room in you. From Adam we learned that he didn't protect his wife. From Moses we learn to share responsibility and leadership with others. From Joseph we learn that bragging can end you up in a hole. From Solomon we learn that all the wisdom in the world cannot win over pride and lust. From Peter we learn to develop an ear to listen before we open our big mouth. And from Jesus we learn, not my will, but thine be done. Five keys to guarding and not giving permission to those things. Yeah, it's interesting when I had that mini stroke, I'll get onto those in a moment. They go through various questions to identify why this may have happened. Before they go into checking arteries and everything else, they do a check. You know, so do you drink, do you smoke, do you do this, do you do this, do you do this, is this, this, this. They want to know, first of all, before we dive into looking into your body, are you giving permission in your life for this to happen? And when he said, do you drink coffee? I mean, I'm not answering that. He goes, "Uh (laughs) aha. He had me on that one. Are you exercising? I said, can I have another doctor? He said, no. Are you exercising? I said, a little bit. He goes, well, there you go. Now let's check your body out. The question is, please question yourself. Search me out, Lord, and know my heart, I pray. If you're too obstinate or prideful, you're going to be like Solomon and you're just not going to listen. From Peter, we learn to develop an ear to listen. Number one, stay in fellowship. Five keys. You see, the wonderful thing about a church like this is your brothers and sisters won't be able to help themselves but tell you if you're being silly. And I like that. Don't let pride get in the road. They're going to walk up to you and they're going to go, why are you doing that? And you go, my goodness, I thought this was church. Yep, that's part of the reason for church. Or they're going to say, you're such a blessing. Right, all sorts of things are going to happen in the house of God. The house of God, the church itself, I should say, is not a palace, it's a hospital. And when you realize that, you'll stay in fellowship, one with your brothers and sisters, because we need one another. Number two, read the Bible. According to, I think it was Charisma magazine, the average Christian reads the Bible seven minutes a month. The Bible, you see, the Word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides you between soul and, tr- soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It, 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 the Bible is the only book that when you read it, it reads you. And it's a good idea to read the Bible. Do you agree? Yes. It's a very good idea to read the Bible. Yes. Because in it, the spirit of life, the Holy Spirit speaks to you like no other sermon, no other message. Do you know, I'm convinced that if people actually read their Bible more, they would need less church services. Now, you know, we'd we'd still have our Sunday morning, but I think there'd be a lot more emboldened, strong Christians if they did. Don't, number, number three, get some sleep. Number four, don't lie to yourself. Wake up and smell the roses and start to realize what you're giving permission to, what you're saying, perhaps not to others, but to yourself is not true. And you move in life and make decisions when the Holy Spirit directs you. You see, we see an example of this in Exodus. Uh, Exodus 13, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So as to go by day and night, he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. 
And in the new covenant, he says to us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Move when I'm moving on you. Pray before you go and do things. As I've said before, I'm convinced, had they prayed at the beginning of the iceberg with the Titanic, things may have turned out a little better instead of praying at the end. In 2 Timothy, we read, For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. But just because you have a sound mind doesn't mean you know how to use it. So try not to allow your mind to have to undergo more than it was capable of undergoing in the first place. You'll make decisions that are poor decisions and then wake up one day and go, what was I thinking? And it's because you gave yourself permission to be under stress or under circumstances. You just, sometimes you just got to say no. And we're all guilty of giving permission to things in our life we just should not. Be careful of social media, that's an obvious one. Be careful of the teachers that are out there today. Every time I see the word revival, I just want to chuck up. That's terrible to say for you, isn't it? Because I know that we can't make revival happen. If it doesn't happen in me with the Holy Spirit, it's never going to happen out there around about me. The, the church needs to stop trying to make revival happen and just trust the Lord. Be more obedient. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then God will move in a revival when God is. Get your focus off a revival and get it onto God. And you'll be good to go. Instead, just yesterday, I see this church advertising, nobody here, so that's all right. You know, revival, revival. And I know the ministry. I've been in ministry since I was 23. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just a, 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 a big billboard to get a crowd. And the people are not changed. Unless it challenges you, it won't change you. And that sort of thing doesn't challenge you. It excites the crowd. <coughs> it's the same thing that Jesus said about John the Baptist. What did you come out to see? What did you go to church for today? And so I believe we need to have that truth about our hearts. God, I'm not going to expose my body or my mind to things that I just cannot manage. I'm not going to give permission to those things anymore. I'm going to understand boundaries. Women, if you let a guy over to your house at 11 o'clock at night, don't tell me something won't happen. Don't do it. If you're going to get onto social media, don't think that chatting on social media is going to stay clean. Chances are it won't. Don't do it. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Because later on you're going to feel guilty, you're going to feel bad, you're going to go to bed that night and there's nothing softer than a clear conscience. But when it's not clear, that pillar is hard. And so what you want to do is not have a breakdown later, you want to have a build up now where you can say, I am not perfect in everything I do, but I know who is perfect. Amen. And I thank you, Lord, that you're carrying me through. And, uh, you know, he carries us on his shoulder and we keep falling off. And he goes, hang a bit, get back up there. Just because you have it, just because you have this sound mind doesn't mean you know how to use it. And in closing, so we have time to, to um, have a talk to our church plant over in the Pacus. And do you receive something like from that today? Don't give permission to it. Don't give permission. You see, if you dwell on what you don't have, you're giving permission for the enemy to move on you in anxiety or depression. If you don't eat correctly, you're giving permission for other things. If you're an argumentative person, knock it off. You're just giving permission for other people and you're just thriving on that thing. Don't go there anymore. I want to encourage you, church, in a, in a year of truth that it's not what you do later on. It's what you gave, you gave permission to in the beginning. You teach people how to treat you. Now, God loves you and he will keep rescuing you but do we need God to rescue us all the time? <laughs> Can't we just, you know, praise the Lord he doesn't grow tired or weary. Praise God he neither slumbers nor sleeps. But he does spend a lot of time saving his people. In Habakkuk we read, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets 
that he may run who reads it. When I read that, I consider my life and I want to spell out clearly what is acceptable and what is not. What I will live with and what I won't. What I give permission to and what I don't. If you don't know what it is, then ain't nobody else going to either. Why are you complaining about how people treat you when you don't make it plain how you want to be treated? You receive that? You get that? Give this some consideration, friends. You might offend some people. Better to offend that person now to bring about reconciliation than to have a long-term drama all the rest of your life with that human being. You want to deal with it today. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Deal with it today and say, God, I'm just not going to give permission anymore for those things because I can't manage sin. You had to die for it. That's how it was managed. It was broken. And that's the only way it could be managed because sin will kill you. Because you know how I know that? You try to manage sin, it'll kill you just like it did Jesus. But Jesus took it on himself. You don't need to take it on yourself. You don't have to give permission for those things anymore. And I'd like you, in a few moments, we've got 10 minutes till we talk to our church in Pakistan, so we're going to a few moments break, get the coffee, then I'll call you all back. We'll have them on the screen and Richard can get himself organised. That's worked out well. I'd like you to repent. Now, repentance is saying, I make an active choice. I was going that way, I'm going to go that way. Physically, emotion. Some of you are carrying emotional stuff. You gave permission to it. Now you're going to have to repent of that. Because you're, you're an addict <laughs> to letting things like that happen. There's a lot of Christian addicts in the church that allow for things to happen under the, whatever we might call, let's say, compassion or whatever it might be. When you, when you allow even a good thing like compassion to lead you to a place where you can no longer manage yourself, you've given permission to things that are going to lead you astray. And it's not about what people do to you, it's about what you give permission for others to do to you. <laughs> Is that you're very quiet. Somebody a couple of weeks ago said, don't judge me. I said, too right, I will. If I don't judge you, God will. How about we sort this out right now? What you are is in error. The Bible doesn't say not to judge you. It says not to make a judgment upon you. I am telling you now, you are wrong. You are in error. I told a couple just the last couple of weeks, she's a Christian, he's not a Christian. We're having a chat and I said, well, you can't get married. He goes, what? I said, you can't get married. You, you haven't even received the Lord. She is, you're not. And she big smile on her face. I said, I'm just trying to rescue you from a life of heartache. And she said, thank you. You give permission to that girl, you'll regret it later. And if you don't, he will. Because <laughs> you'll be wanting to sing Christian songs and he'll be wanting to sing something else. Now, some of you are already in those situations. You gave permission to it. I want to minister these words to you from the Lord. His grace is sufficient for you. Can you receive that? So you were silly. You were a dummy. <laughs> you just shouldn't have done it. You're sitting here thinking, oh dear, why did I do it? Oh, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. You did. And now you're living with it. Well, God's grace is sufficient for you. And just as he rescued Peter from the water, he'll rescue you too. Let's pray. Julie, would you come forward and just begin to play that? Just uh, one of those last songs. Because he lives is lovely. Would you just play that in the background? And if you're on the audio right now and you've heard this and you're feeling like, oh my goodness, I'd like you to receive this prayer too. Let us all repent from those things. And, and Lord, teach us now. Father, teach us now what boundaries are all about. Help us to have a mind that thinks properly. 
Oh, we already have that. We just need to learn it. And so we want to put down those things that would get in the road. Pride is a big one. I know because I'm an older person. Well, Lord, forgive us for that because that's pride as well. Lord, teach us through the Holy Spirit wisdom to think a, a little bit more ahead than what we do sometimes. And the passions and the lust for the life and things that we give permission to forgive us for those things. Don't us forgive us, Lord. We repent that we might not allow for things in our life. We might not give permission to those things anymore. And that we would honour you and our life would be a life of honour. Not a life where we're constantly begging for you to help us all the time. That we would have a life that we could add value and help others. So I pray for your protection upon this congregation and all those listening on the audio. That we might be a people that the world might see Jesus in all of us. And we want to receive this now. In Jesus' name.